Dr. Hegel is the Chief Technology Officer for Magic Med Industries Incorporated, a company focused on creating a library of novel derivative molecules based on classic psychedelics such as psilocybin. After receiving her PhD in opiate biosynthesis from the University of Calgary in 2010, Dr. Hegel continued postdoctoral work in the area of natural products metabolism with a focus on benzophenanthrogene, I hope I pronounced that right, and opiate alkaloids, amphetamine analogs, and cannabinoids. Following four years of postdoctoral work, she co-founded three biotechnology companies, including Epimeron Incorporated, now Willow Biosciences, and Magic Med Industries. Dr. Hegel has co-authored over 40 peer-reviewed research articles and is co-inventor of 18 patents or patent applications. This presentation is sponsored by the Alberta Mycological Society for its members, and with the gracious support of Nature Alberta, we have been able to open up attendance of this talk to members of the public. Uh, so with that, uh, I hope you all give a very warm virtual welcome to Dr. Jill Hegel, and I'll pass it off to you, Dr. Hegel. Thanks. Thank you, Jacob. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here to be able to speak um, with this um, society. And um, you guys are doing great work, and it's an honor to be here. Um, as Jacob said, I'm Chief uh, Technology Officer at Magic Med Industries. And uh, this company uh, operates in part out of the University of Calgary as a spin-off, um, in part out of uh, Professor Ficini, Pierre Ficini's laboratory. Uh, Professor Ficini is also the CSO of Magic Med. And uh, my talk today will focus on the magic of mushrooms. And I'll bring us through a little bit of the history of humanity's use um, of mushrooms, and then discuss where we can go from here in making the most of this medicine through derivatization. Okay. So magic mushrooms have been used for millennia and across the world. Evidence dates back a long time and across different cultures and all continents except for Antarctica. The historical context of traditional use is, is largely lost. Uh, there are some exceptions, of course, um, where indigenous peoples around the world use these mushrooms in traditional ways today. So I'll bring us through, um, I guess, a map and also through time um, describing the use of these mushrooms through history. Beginning here in Spain, so um, there are cave paintings. This one is the Salva pa cave painting. Um, it dates back about um, 8,000 years. And there is a hunting scene with some animals, including this bison you see here. Uh, but interestingly, there are what appear to be a series of mushrooms that are featured. And there's been some talk among academics that these mushrooms are very similar uh, to a very local mushroom called Psilocybe Hispanica, which happens to be local. Now here in Tanzania, there is um, a tribe today called the Sandawe people who uh, use magic mushrooms in their ceremonies. And this painting here in the A panel um, brought about in a research paper um, by Dr. Pettigrew in 2011, he compared this rock art painting by the um, existing Sandawe people with that in panel B, which is a cave painting that is um, 12,000 years old in Northern Australia. And he did note the similarities between these cave paintings. And it's known that the one to the left, which was recently done, describes the use by shamans, uh, the use of magic mushrooms and a trance state that um, um, comes about by using those mushrooms. So it, it is something that's discussed, whether this painting in Northern Australia also depicts the same thing. Here back in Europe, um, in Italy, in Aquila specifically, there's a mosaic from the pre-Renaissance showing a bunch of mushrooms being tossed into a pot. And some have, um, some have wondered uh, because of the anatomical similarity with a local Amanita muscaria mushroom, these could be depictions of magic mushrooms as well. And I'd like to also highlight Mesoamerica, uh, both ancient cultures like those of the Maya and the Aztec and more modern cultures, uh, indigenous peoples use and have used magic mushrooms for a long time. This rock art here is a carving from the Mayan people showing a mushroom sprouting out of um, what is thought to be a shaman. So what makes mushrooms magic in the first place? Well, arguably it's the compounds that they contain that induce hallucinogenic or trance states. 
I'll feature first the compound psilocybin and related indole alkaloids. So the compound in the center here, if you can see my cursor, shows psilocybin molecule, which is a tryptamine type molecule with a very interesting phosphate group on there, which is not very common among these kinds of molecules. Psilocybin is contained in a number of different mushrooms, but um, especially uh, psilocybin genus members. And this map here shows a number of different spots around the world where psilocybe genus members are known to occur. So each circle is a location where a psilocybe species is known to, to, to be. Uh, you can see there's a large concentration in Central America, along the coastal regions of the Americas and um, Australia, Europe, and Japan. Um, and it's notable that Although psilocybin species often contain psilocybin upward of 2% per dry weight, some psilocybin species don't contain any psilocybin at all, as I'm illustrating in this chart below that map. Um, and a species of this uh, psilocybin genus are still being described today. So the panel to the far bottom right here is a new species described uh, in 2015 in Germany, psilocybin um, germanica. So another compound that's found in some species is called ivotenic acid. This molecule is illustrated right here at the bottom center. And it's found especially in this cute little mushroom here, Amanita muscaria, which is just smurf-like and adorable, but don't be fooled because it's toxic, um, quite toxic in fact. Although that doesn't really uh, prevent many people from eating it. Um, and if you survive the experience of eating these mushrooms, you will go through a number of different, um, well, uh, physiological changes, including visual and auditory aesthesia, space and time distortion, tiredness, sleep, and finally vivid dreams. And it's been thought that perhaps this kind of mushroom, the ingestion of this mushroom has inspired art and literature throughout the ages, especially in Central and Northern Europe. Um, for example, um, the Victorian writer, Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland, it's being brought up that perhaps he was influenced by this mushroom when he wrote the book. Alice, as you know, eats a mushroom described very similar to Amanita and goes through a series of space and time distortions. And of course, we see mosaics and art highlighting mushrooms that look like Amanita. And I want to point out to the bottom right corner, um, the famous Norse berserkers, uh, they were a, a very fierce um, warrior known in Norse mythology. It was thought that perhaps a preparation of Amanita, which is local, uh, was used to instill in them a very brave and hallucinogenic state before war. Although now it's thought perhaps um, there is contribution from the um, the deadly nightshade instead, which contains hyosthenine. So I'd like to also talk about ergot alkaloids. Now these ones are, are more, um, shall we say, a, a double-edged sword. There's horrific um, things that can come about from this alkaloid type, but also interesting and good things too. So throughout history, uh, there has been incidences of ergotism, which means that people have eaten rye or other grains that have been infected with this for primarily this um, genus, but other genus too of fungus, claviceps. So here we have a picture of infected rye. If you eat grain infected by these, this kind of fungus, you may end up with ergotism, which is has a variety of um, uh, symptoms, but you can um, expect that perhaps you'll get gangrene and lose limbs is quite horrific. And here we have paintings from um, the Renaissance era. This one up here is called The Beggar, The Beggars, which shows uh, people who have survived uh, ergotism, um, but have lost limbs. This one down here is a, a man in the throes of ergotism. Um, it's a detail from the painting, um, St. Anthony's Fire. And uh, I would like to note, though, that not all of these fungi are parasitic to the plant. Some actually live as symbionts. So in the morning glory plant, um, some species anyways, uh, the seeds 
um, contain often a fungus that lives symbiotically and is transferred from generation to generation vertically in the seeds. And these fungi produce um, a specific kind of ergot alkaloid um, among which is called lysergic acid. And lysergic acid, by the way, is a very popular precursor to the chemical transformation to LSD, which happens to be one of our first successful derivatives. Although it does not um, induce ergotism, it's being um, fast-tracked by the FDA in clinical trials for the treatment of depression. Now, uh, I would like to point out too that there's many traditional uses for morning glory seeds, particularly in Central America. So not all ergot alkaloids are bad. I'd like to point out some plant-based psychedelics while we're on the topic. The um, peyote cactus, as many of you know, accumulates this compound called mescaline. Um, I'd also like to point out dimethyltryptamine, which if you can follow my cursor is this molecule here, um, which is shown atop of a preparation of ayahuasca. DMT is very similar in structure to psilocybin, but unlike psilocybin, the effects are very short lived if taken alone. So DMT activates among other receptors, the 5-HT2A receptor, which is thought to induce hallucinations. But because DMT um, is broken down quickly by the human enzyme monoamine oxidase, the effects only last one hour or maybe two. But in ayahuasca preparations, often you have more than one plant and the second plant often will um, contain these alkaloids called harmala alkaloids. So harmine, harmaline, and so forth. And these compounds actually block the MAO activity, allowing the uh, the DMT effects to last longer. Here in the bottom left-hand corner, I'm showing three different preparations of ayahuasca and the amount respectively of DMT and hermala alkaloids. You can see, depending on what preparation is used in a ceremony, you get different kinds of, of compounds there in different amounts. Ibogaine, which is to the top left here, is a compound that um, induces hallucinations, but also is known to um, have possible benefits for addiction as addiction treatments. Unfortunately, it's cardiotoxic to some extent, although derivatives have been made recently. There's a nature paper out in the end of last year where they um, derivatized ibogaine, which comes from the iboga tree and uh, reduced the amount of hallucination almost to zero and, um, but it still had therapeutic effects. Salvia uh, divinorum plant, makes this compound here, um, salvinorin A, which uh, actually activates a very different receptor type. And the hallucinations are, from what I understand, not very positive. Now, I'd like to indicate here that both ibogaine and salvia, or salvinorin A have undergone extensive derivatization. And here, this molecule, salvinorin A, which is the same um, as the one on the bottom left, is just showing here that the R group that is uh, adjusted right here in the molecule can be one of many different things. This is from a publication um, recently in 2020. And by adding different R groups to the molecule, you see um, different receptor binding properties. So the KI changes, the EC50 potency changes. So when you start playing with those molecules, you can get different pharmacological effects. So a little bit about the modern science, government and pop culture surrounding these molecules, which, you know, this is where it gets quite interesting because this really is um, where these things become relevant today. I'll begin with Albert Hoffman, the Swiss chemist, uh, which is shown in this laboratory, uh, Sandoz Laboratories is where he worked, a company in Switzerland. And he was the first to synthesize LSD. And he tried half a gram of it one day after work and tried to bicycle home after that. And um, his experience, which was quite remarkable, um, he relayed to his senior uh, colleagues at Sandoz and Sandoz then patented quickly LSD and began selling it to companies and institutions around the world for, for further study and clinical use. Some of this clinical use was good and some was bad. Um, or at least it wasn't done in a scientific way. So the CIA uh, really um, got into the use of psychedelics as part of their efforts for mind control, like Project MK Ultra. maybe some of you have heard. And the um, CIA um, was able to fund covertly a bunch of 
studies around the world, including one at McGill University. So um, there was a, a patient um, study uh, where it was uh, done through the psychiatry department at um, in the 1950s and 60s in, at McGill University where LSD among other things were used on patients without their knowledge or consent. And that was um, part of a larger study where electroshock therapy and other things were used. So that wasn't quite as positive as we'd like. And in a more benign way in Saskatchewan, um, mescaline and then um, psilocybin and finally LSD were tested um, among um, alcohol addicts throughout the prairies and uh, with, with some degree of success, but that program was shut down later. Now, popularization of um, these compounds really became um, a big deal. Um, Gordon Wassum was one of the big proponents of, um, or at least popularizing, uh, he was responsible for part of the popularization of psychedelics within the United States. He um, traveled to uh, Central America and um, was able to hook up with a very famous shaman, Maria Sabina, where she took him through a ceremony involving magic mushrooms. And he wrote about his experience in Life magazine, um, which uh, helped popularize the use of these psychedelics. Now, we all know that in the 1960s, psychedelics really came to the forefront. And part of this was due to people like Timothy Leary and his... Um, his colleagues, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert began as um, assistant Harvey walked into their office um, without permission of Harvard. As you can imagine, it didn't go very well. Um, and they were fired not too long after they were hired from Harvard. But uh, Timothy Leary went on to uh, to generate a lot of buzz and he had a quite a big fan base, although he had some detractors as well. I'd like to point out Louis Menon, who was um, a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Um, he declared that Leary liked women, he liked being the center of attention and he liked to get high. Richard Nixon um, declared him the most dangerous man in America, which really is a bit of a stretch, but as we will see soon, Nixon had um, ulterior motives for this for this kind of um, thought. And Allen Ginsberg though, declared him a hero of American consciousness. So the jury is still out on this fellow. But of course the influence of psychedelics uh, reached music, reached fashion. It really um, was pervasive in the culture. And, and um, I think that really uh, brings us to where we are today, what happened in the 1960s. Unfortunately, all of this buzz uh, created um, in part by the people I've talked about, was hijacked in a sense, um, may I say that, uh, by politics of the day. So Richard Nixon in the United States declared war on drugs in 1971. And he had signed the Controlled Substances Act, which I'll talk about in a minute, which really made it uh, difficult to, if, if not impossible, for anyone to have access to these things. Um, now, the reality was is, um, and this is actually something I'd, I'd like to point out. Uh, there was uh, a contemporary of uh, Richard Nixon, uh, John Elrickman, who was a uh, part of the Nixon administration. And he was interviewed in 1994 um, and it was published in Harper Magazine. Uh, his discussion went something like this, quote, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the Vietnam War or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana, and Blacks with heroin, then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did, which is, it really sheds light on perhaps the motivation of the war on drugs. Um, not that heroin is, is good, but I think that um, psychedelics kind of got dragged along with the whole bandwagon. And this chart here, I'd like to point out, there, the red arrow shows where the war on drugs took place in 1970, 71, and incarceration rates in the US skyrocketed after that, often the jails um, full of minorities, which is unfortunate. So here is um, the current version of the uh, Controlled Substances Act in the US. Uh, this is changing because um, interestingly, the US is now spearheading a very big change with how it treats psychedelics. But we have heroin, um, which we all know uh, can be destructive, listed along in Schedule 1 with LSD, mescaline, and peyote. 
um, which is odd because we know that psychedelics do not have a high risk for addiction, high potential for physical and psychological dependence. It's just not true. Um, and they're listed as more dangerous than cocaine, for example. But I'd like to add this is changing as we speak in the US. So all of this politics really created a 25 year hiatus in human research. Um, the politics in the US and around the world really um, shut things down for a while, but scientists in Germany, US and Switzerland um, in the 1990s began slowly reinvestigating psychedelics for their use in, as, um, as various treatments, which I'll get into shortly. These 1990 studies supported a small handful of early phase clinical trials in people. Um, and of course, these sample sizes were initial, initially small and modest, but things uh, got bigger. And today, the uh, certain psychedelics have been fast tracked by the FDA, at least in the US, for use in the treatment of things like depression. So here are some of the uh, clinical trials that took place in. Um, in the last decade, and I'd like to point out that they've gotten bigger and better since then. But unlike what happened in the 60s where Timothy Leary was using unorthodox methods to investigate the use of psychedelics, now we have proper scientific controls. Psychedelics are now being um, considered as any other pharmaceutical and undergo the same kind of testing procedures, including double blind reverse crossovers, so DBRCT, plus the use of placebos, um, crossover between arms of experiments. Finally, psychedelics are being um, treated like any other drug, um, both good and bad, um, and held up to scientific scrutiny. Uh, the number of people in the studies, of course, began rather modest. Here we have a study with only nine people. Here we have one with 20, then 51. And the studies, um, of course, select very carefully uh, their, their population um, for this kind of trial. So the numbers still aren't as big as they might be for vaccines, but we are getting um, into the realm of, of large studies that are published in Lancet Psychiatry and other very high-end journals. So finally, um, I think we're, we're reaching a point where we at least can bring these things um, to the edge of um, scientific research and, and investigate them properly. Here I have a number of different papers or headings for papers where um, it's discussed whether these things are useful for things like major depressive disorders, substance use disorders, and so on. Um, there is research and data that show indeed um, various uh, psychedelics are useful, at least they, they look to be useful, they show promise for the treatment of these um, ailments. And here's some more here, um, headaches even and um, eating disorders, uh, these um, ailments are all being, um, the psychedelics are being investigated for the treatments of all these ailments. Um, interestingly, this paper just came out like a, a couple weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, we are comparing psychedelics head to head now with existing treatments. Um, this one, um, psilocybin versus esculapram, uh, excuse me. Um, and according to this study, um, psilocybin fares at least as well, if not better, because there's reduced side effects. So it is an exciting time for these um, to be soon treatments. Now, of course, um, like any drug, uh, there is room for improvement. There is nothing that's perfect. Um, in many cases, there, re there are reports of fear, anxiety, and paranoia among people who take these drugs. Psychological symptoms can last longer than a week. And of course, there's always a small population that will respond atypically. So caution and care must always be exercised. And more study is needed, frankly. Because of the 25 year hiatus, we do not understand the pharmacology very well of how these drugs really work. Um, unlike other drugs uh, that have been investigated thoroughly, these ones require a lot more, uh, we're still playing catch up, if you will. And the pharmacology is very complex. I'll talk about here how psilocin, which is um, the immediate um, uh, down product of uh, psilocybin, Psilocin acts at a number of different receptors. The one that's always um, talked about is a 5-HT2A receptor because that's the one that we think induces hallucinations. And by the way, um, a lower KI means um, it, the drug tightly binds that receptor. A higher number means it, it binds less well or more loosely to that receptor. 
um, there are a number of 5-HT receptors and um, psilocin binds them with um, higher or lower affinities. Some um, receptors respond really well, or at least they tightly bind to psilocin and others not as much. And um, histamine receptor, um, you have uh, one or a couple of the adrenergic receptors that respond in a loose way. And one of the dopamine receptors, there's a bit of um, loose binding. Um, this is just the, the edge of what we're trying to figure out because these things just have not been investigated properly. Uh, so really it's not that these drugs or at least psilocin bind one receptor and you get one response. It's more of um, a combination of receptor responses um, that I can liken to um, playing a chord on, pia on a piano where um, you have one note or a couple notes being pressed hard for a long time. Some notes within the chord are pressed lightly for um, a longer time. And it, basically it's the chord that's the effect, not one or two notes. And uh, so it is complicated. We're just beginning to learn about how these things work. Now, I often get this question um, within my business and at the university, uh, Jill, if we already have psilocybin and mescaline and so forth, why are you making derivatives? Which I think is a very good question. So um, I'd like to point out that any natural product that has shown promise in the treatment of, of various disorders has gone through a series of generations uh, in the scientific community to create new drugs, better drugs, alternative drugs. And I have a few examples here. So salicin, for example, which is found in willow bark, um, does treat headaches and pain um, with reasonable effectiveness. And it was the inspiration for aspirin by Bayer um, Chemical Company a long time ago. Aspirin um, is uh, a more effective drug than salicin and it has reduced side effects. There's so many examples here. These are just a few, but I'll point out that artemisinin, which is an effective anti-malarial drug found in the quinine tree, uh, it has inspired probably dozens, um, quite a few anti-malarials um, that are similar, but they're um, derivatives, if you will, of artemisinin. So here I have one shown. And often these derivatives are used in combination with artemisinin itself as combo drugs to treat malaria, uh, because it's more effective to do the combination than it is artemisinin alone. Taxol is from the, um, the taxol tree, and it is an inspiration for a number of even more effective anti-cancers. Um, there's so many examples. Opiates, which is where my background comes in. Uh, during my PhD, I worked on this class. Morphine and codeine are natural drugs from the opium puppy plant, and they uh, are still used today, but they inspired a host of, of drugs, um, some good and some bad, like, like everything, it's a two-edged sword. Uh, Narcan and Subutex are very similar to morphine and they actually treat opioid addiction. On the other hand, we have heroin, um, which is very similar to morphine and it is not the greatest drug to be, um, to be involved with. So how do we make derivatives or even explore them in the first place? I'll use an example here where we can take something like psilocin and begin playing with the molecule. Now, this is not um, our work, but it's uh, showing that uh, work that's being done in the academic realm. Um, there's been bits of uh, information here and there on um, psilocin derivatization. Uh, in this case, uh, scientists added a fluorine um, in different parts of the molecule, or they took nitrogen and derivatized um, the amino nitrogen with uh, different um, alkyl groups. In some cases, there was no change, at least at the 5-HT2A receptor. In other cases, you could reduce the binding or reduce the duration of action at that receptor. So we are getting differences, at least in vitro. Similarly, for dimethyltryptamine, um, there's been some research showing, showing that you can get tighter binding at that receptor, very tight binding. And interestingly, um, we have the example here, serotonin, which as you know, is a natural molecule. And if you compare it with the structure of dimethyltryptamine, it's quite similar, um, which makes you wonder um, why serotonin doesn't have the same psychedelic effects, but it could be that serotonin is rapidly degraded, uh, not at the synapse per se, but uh, if you ingest it as a, a pill or something, um, orally, you'll, it will be rapidly degraded in the body and likely doesn't have a chance to work. So beyond just action at receptors, we have to consider the whole 
gamut of what can happen um, when taken orally or intravenously, what the body does to these molecules. So derivatization does make a big difference and we're only beginning to understand how. No talk on um, this class of molecules will be complete with a famous uh, Dr. Alexander Shulgin who uh, passed away a number of years ago, but his influence has been um, insurmountable in this area. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he was a chemist who worked with Dow Chemical um, back in the 60s. And he developed some really interesting anti pesticides actually um, that were quite successful for the company. But he um, was gently told to retire, shall we say, because of his unorthodox practices within the company. But he took those practices and, and brought them literally to his home, where he began synthesizing his own molecules at home and ingesting them and um, documenting the activity um, among him and his friends as well. And uh, a couple of his fans, um, Cozy and Daly in 2016, published this study where they took five or six molecules that he had, Dr. Alexander Shulgin had made, and they did a, a swath of um, receptor binding studies on these molecules just to see how they, they worked. And this is the kind of stuff that we're gonna to need to do for a large number of molecules, um, not just those by um, Shulgin. We have to really expand what we're able to test to find the right ones. So expanding our pharmacopoeia, um, where do we even begin? Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the drug development process, uh, you can imagine it it starts in vitro, where you take these, these drugs, you do a lot of receptor binding studies on cell cultures, um, on um, membranes that contain the receptors, and you do a lot of toxicology and safety studies before you even get to animal models. Um, un unfortunately, I suppose, for mice and rats, I'm a big rat fan, actually. Um, these poor little animals, uh, they do help us out a lot, though, because they are the, the study uh, or the the, um, the model that's used um, to uh, study the toxicity and in vivo effects before we go to human clinical trials. And there's a number of behavioral models um, that we do with rats as well. Um, those at the University of Calgary might know um, the Hotchkiss Brain Institute has a couple of researchers there that are examining the effects of psychedelics um, using models that they develop in rats. And um, of course, uh, this is uh, something that's being studied uh, in a, an official way. So clinical studies done in humans, um, the last I checked, there was 282 studies being registered with the US um, administration anyways. And these studies were on things like psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, and so forth. Um, and these studies are fast-tracked uh, just because of the nature of the molecules, which they've been around for a long time, so they don't need to go through the same amount of um, scrutiny. Um, and I think um, it won't be long before we'll see Canada following suit. Now, what about novel pharmaceuticals, though? Beyond those known molecules where more study is done, um, what does it take for a derivative, a totally new molecule, to get through the system and end up in people's um, medicine cabinets? Answer is it takes about 10 to 15 years. So, and a lot of money, by the way, um, upward of a billion dollars to get a single molecule made, tested, and um, through regulatory approval to market. Um, so drug discovery, preclinical and clinical trials, and finally regulatory approval, these are all the steps that you need to get something all the way to market. So it's a huge, um, it's a huge job. Uh, of course, uh, the company I work with is right now stationed only at um, phase one. Um, we don't plan on bringing things all the way through ourselves. It's just too much work and too much money. Our aim is simply to partner with those that do that job. Uh, we do develop new molecules though, using chemistry and biochemistry techniques, which I'll get into in a minute. You need to test large numbers of compounds, by the way, to finally get one that actually works, that isn't toxic, it's safe at various doses, it's not too expensive and so forth. Um, a lot of work goes into developing these drugs, that's for sure. Now, combinatorial chemistry, I'd like to point out, is one of the techniques that we use at MagicMan to develop new drugs. And I'll use the example of euhimbine because there's been some nice studies on this molecule using combinatorial chemistry. Yohimbine, by the way, is a natural molecule that is used, among other things, for erectile dysfunction, at least in the naturopathic world. 
So here we have a derivative, um, that, an easy one to make that was done by chemists. Uh, the publication is down there in 2013. Um, the chemist took this molecule, broke open one of the rings so that we have a free nitrogen and hydroxyl group. Uh, the nitrogen can be derivatized. Um, they added not just one R group, but they took this molecule and added a wide number of R groups through um, combinatorial chemistry to generate 36 different molecules based solely on two reaction types, which uh, really is a quick way, if you will, to make new chemicals. Um, so each of these molecules here highlighted in yellow or moieties rather um, could be added and was added to the molecule that's highlighted here as the R group. Uh, they took that a very e somewhat easy to make molecule based on the human being structure and added a bromine. Um, now halogens are really nice. You can use click chemistry to do a quick substitution and end up with um, a variety of different R groups. Um, I won't show all the R groups here, but a number of them are made. You can put bromine in a different position um, and do click chemistry again to get a wide variety of R group stationed there. And these authors were able to, using um, this one um, molecule type, create 180 new molecules based on combinatorial chemistry. So it is a fairly um, powerful technique. And um, there are drawbacks, of course, uh, purification is, is uh, a bit of a job, but uh, it is, I think, uh, it's the approach that I think uh, a lot of companies and um, scientists are taking uh, to push forward the numbers that are needed for clinical trials. Now, biochemistry is another technique we use, and it's, a, I mean, everything that we do, of course, is also, uh, it's not unique. It's done by scientists in academia and in industry around the world. Um, but I will describe a bit of the process. So um, through what some people call synthetic biology, which is it's really just a genetic engineering of microorganisms, you can um, relocate a whole pathway um, found in mushroom, for example, or plants to a microorganism by engineering it. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae and E. coli are popular microbial hosts for engineering. Uh, engineering can be done using CRISPR, especially for the yeast or um, multi-factor plasma type engineering for E. coli. And you end up with a culture that um, can make things that usually are found in um, plants or mushrooms. And um, it's being published um, now that uh, you have uh, organisms that are able to make CBD, opiates, artemisinin, taxol, all these things. Um, it's notable too that scientists have achieved psilocybin production in yeast and E. coli um, to over one gram per liter. And um, they've also achieved halfway to LSD. And I have the references if you want these afterward. Now, this is a great way to also do derivatization because you can take these pathways that are engineered um, or do it yourself. That's the preferable way. And then start messing with the metabolism to try to create new things using these organisms. And that's what I'll highlight here. And this, um, I uh, have a, a diagram here adapted from a publication by Cravens and colleagues in 2019. Um, illustrating the process of um, derivatized, making derivatized molecules through synthetic biology. In the top um, panel, and by the way, this large rectangle is a, a schematic way of showing um, a single cell of a, an engineered microbe. And this is a, a schematic way of showing how these molecules are made and derivatized. So, the yellow octagon represents the starting material that the bacteria or yeast uses to make um, its product, whether it be psilocybin or whatever. Um, the enzymes, which are engineered into the organism, here schematically shown as red and black Pac-Mans, take the starting material and add a, a group to it, which is um, a, a natural reaction that occurs um, in the, the native host. Uh, the final product here being a blue octagon with a, a black dot on it. So you can imagine that might be psilocybin, for example, the native pathway would make that. Now you can start to mess with it um, by feeding an alternative substrate. So the second panel shows that we have an octagon with a red dot on it. Maybe you fed that to the E. coli and instead of um, taking a native substrate, the Pac-Mans now use this molecule and end up with a molecule that has something different on it. So now we've made our first derivative. 
Um, the third panel shows that you can skip steps sometimes. Um, if you skip this step uh, with this scheme, you would end up with a blue octagon um, with no substituents. Um, that's just showing you schematically you've made another derivative. You can add in new enzymes um, that aren't normally found in the pathway. So this green enzyme can be from totally somewhere else. It can be from humans or from birds or whatever. And you add that to the microorganism. And if it takes the substrate, it'll add yet another group and make yet another derivative. And finally, in the bottom panel, it's just showing you, you can really mix and match these methods. So you can feed an alternative substrate, skip a step and add in a new enzyme and you get an octagon with um, a new group, actually two new groups, and it's missing a group it normally has. So um, essentially uh, you can make a natural product, say psilocybin or whatever, using microorganisms that are engineered, but you can also make derivatives by playing with your pathway. Um, so finally, I'd just like to say, um, chemists and biochemists are both required for this kind of engineering. Um, a lot of companies and, and academics tend to stick to either one or the other. You'll have a chemistry lab that makes derivatives of, of psilocybin or, or whatever, um, but biochemists might stick to themselves and you'll have, you know, engineering of pathways to make the natural product or start derivatizing it. But I, in my view, if you combine these two methods, uh, you get more, more diversity possible. So things that a biochemist might make can be further derivatized in ways unimaginable by a chemist and vice versa. And, you know, my background is biochemistry. So I, I thought this would be a nice picture to throw in there where a biochemist is in the lab, not using gloves, you know, smoking. He has his little mascot turtle walking around. Um, <clears throat> historically, biochemists and biologists uh, are seen as a little bit lax in, in how they approach things. And the chemists and my chemist friends argue with this. They say, Jill, that's not true. But, you know, a lot of biochemists view chemists as, you know, these stern, rule-abiding, um, rather rigid people. Um, and of course, these are stereotypes and it's fun to throw them around, but um, work can be done together by combining teams. And finally, um, I'd like to honor the rat and the mouse and all those um, animals that have to be part of this process um, of exploring derivatives um, so that it can be done um, finally in humans to explore whether or not these things um, can um, compete with the drugs already, already in use, uh, whether they're useful for, for people in the treatment of various disorders. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed my talk and I'd like to field um, some questions if you have them. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hegel. That was fascinating. I, I absolutely love the piano analogy for all the neurotransmitters that painted such a clear picture for me. That was really, really cool. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to type them up into the chat or raise your hand and uh, we can unmute you and you can ask directly. Um, but yes, thank you again, Dr. Hegel. That was a wonderful presentation. My pleasure, Jacob. Um, it seems Martin has his hand raised, so feel free to unmute Martin. Hi, Martin. Okay, excellent. Um, so when you're looking at these different chemicals and the different reactions that are happening with them out of, out of a natural product like mushrooms, I mean, how do you know which chemical it is? You know, I mean, it's, you know, for example, I mean, what's the difference between psilocin and, and norcilocin and then and how are they, you know, they're, they're just such minor differences and, and are they causing different reactions? And do you know what some of the chemicals are that, that are ca causing some of the, uh, some of the reactions in people or, or the effects? That's a very good question. Um, you know, it's interesting you ask this because it, this is a big difference between taking the natural product and taking a pharmaceutical grade drug for one thing. And there's good and bad to both, I guess. Uh, there's a lot of division in how people view this. If you eat a magic mushroom, a psilocybin species, you're taking a, a wide variety of things. You're not just taking psilocybin, uh, you're taking psilocin and um, probably even DMT and other things as well. 
Um, and if you have a pharmaceutical grade thing, um, if it ever gets to market, it's likely one pure compound of a known amount. Now, in the studies that we do, because like we're discovery phase, right? Um, we use um, advanced analytical approaches. So actually my background as well, uh, I have a strong background in mass spectrometry. Um, we run everything we make uh, through cultures or, or through chemistry through um, uh, in our laboratory at the university. Uh, Dr. Peter Ficini has a high resolution um, mass orbitrot mass spectrometer. So we, everything we make, we run through there and because it's exact mass and it, there's also long story short, other ways to check, we're fairly sure of what we're looking at. And if we're not, um, we purify it and subject it to NMR. So, you know, we have that capacity to know what we're looking at. And, and of course, um, if things do look promising, uh, actually, we don't even get to know that before we, we have to purify things, of course, and then do in vitro studies on, on compounds that are 90% pure. So that we know that when we are testing um, something um, for receptor binding, we know it's that molecule and not another one that's acting as an antagonist. So the scientific approach is definitely being applied to these molecules, but uh, whether it's, um, it's just viewed differently among people who use the mushroom because it's, um, it's a mixture, right? Um, two different schools of thought. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I, I guess it does, does, does answer it. Question a lot of times, I mean, on a mass spectrometer, you, you, a lot of times you grab the, you know, the low hanging fruit, the stuff that's, you know, the bigger stuff. It's, it's sometimes a little spikes that, uh, that might be, might be, uh, might be a consequence and, and, you know, really hard to actually identify what you actually have there. Yeah, you know, that is, that is true. Um, we're lucky we have a high resolution, resolution instrument, but you're right. So basically mass spec is a way of us checking to see if we're making the right stuff at all. There's obviously a lot in there, right? Cause you're taking E. coli or yeast or a full chemical reaction and there's lots of stuff. Um, we just really use mass spec as a first check to see how much we're making. And if we're making enough, then the next step is purification. So we have, um, chemists, um, and actually it's part of already the, the synthetic chemist routine strategy is to end up crystallizing what they're making. Um, and the biochemists have um, a different way of doing it, but we need to achieve 90% purity um, as, as uh, confirmed by NMR and in some cases, elemental analysis to ensure that what goes on to pharmacological testing is at least 90% pure. Um, because, and I'm not a pharmacologist, but from what I've heard, and there are pharmacology um, scientists tell us this, you can have similar molecules that one will bind and as an agonist and one will be an antagonist. Um, so you don't know what you're looking at um, unless you isolate these things first and you can't um, study them together. You have to study them in, in isolation. One, one more quick question and then I'll let get on to other questions. Um, so are you guys, um, are you guys growing your own mushrooms? And, um, and I guess the real half of the question is, is do you find that the compounds come out different with, with different substrates and, and, and different, different, uh, I guess, growing methods and collection methods, and stuff like that. With that, I'll, I'll mute myself. And your questions are really interesting, Martin. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, um, we aren't working with, well, I don't know if it's unfortunate or fortunate. Um, it's just not what we do. We don't work with the mushroom itself. So um, there is in the literature published uh, pathways for these, these mushrooms. It was done recently, actually, for psilocybe um, cubensis, where they know the enzymes that are used to make psilocybin from tryptophan precursor. So because these enzymes and their gene sequences are known, um, we take the gene sequences, we have them um, synthesized, and we engineer the organism with synthetic genes actually, uh, but they're genes that are uh, based identical to the sequences that are known to occur in mushroom. Um, that being said, uh, Peter Ficini's academic program does explore at a more basic level um, 
mushrooms, uh, more, more especially plants actually, like uh, cacti that make uh, mescaline, for example. Uh, you need both. You need scientists that explore how these things make the final products. Because in some cases we don't know. Mescaline biosynthesis, for example, nobody knows how the cacti make these things. Like the enzymes aren't known. So we can't even begin to engineer it in an organism. Um, so we do, I guess, both. But you know, the company side is more engineering with gene sequences. We don't work with a mushroom directly, but I think it has to be a paired effort by both academics and, and companies to come to a final uh, pipeline that works. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, next we have Emily Lee, if you wanna unmute. Hi, um, I was just wondering, so I'm an undergrad right now at the U of A doing pharmacology. How can I get more involved with this type of research? Oh, that's a, a good question. I find pharmacology so cool. Um, now, I, as an undergrad, I think the first thing I would do um, once you, you know, take required courses, um, you know, I guess as much pharmacology as you can get your hands on. And by the way, if you can take more science courses that can fill in some basic material for you. It's always useful later when if you go to grad studies. And that brings me to my next point. I would search for a supervisor um, at a university that does research on these kind of things. Um, there's some here in Calgary at Hotchkiss Brain Institute, but they also have a very strong pharmacology um, unit at the U of A. And of course, beyond. Um, the world is a big place uh, once COVID is done anyways, and you can really find if your supervisor or potential supervisor has an opening for students, I would go that route first in order to equip yourself to, to either end up studying these in an academic context or to go to industry. I'll be honest, it's a little hard with just um, a bachelor's degree to get into the area to do research. Not that it doesn't happen, um, but generally, um, at least um, from a company perspective, we look for people with master's degrees or PhDs. But that being said, um, you know, anything's possible. But I would, I would try to get uh, some graduate studies under your belt with a lab that does this. All right. Um, do you think there are like opportunities for like shadowing people? Do you think like that sort of stuff is possible? You know, it depends on the lab. Um, coming from the academic community, I'd say, um, yes. Uh, I think there's actually, I mean, my undergrad was 20 years ago, but, um, and I think it's still true that you can take um, final year courses um, where you do a project, for example. Um, you would probably have to go to a professor at your university and say, um, I'd like to do a project with you. Um, and if there's openings, um, it can be included as coursework. It can be like um, a final project that you do where X number of hours you go into their lab and they'll give you a project to work on. Um, as an undergrad, I think you could still do that at your fi the final year of university. Um, and if you find a lab that, that has aligned interest with yours, like a pharmacology lab, that sounds like it would be up your alley. Awesome, thank you again. Uh, Wendy Adamek, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hi, thanks so much. I had no idea this was happening at um, U of C where I also work. My question has to do more with social and therapeutic um, context. And it comes from um, the con um, background with a close friend of mine who's doing the two-year certificate at the California Institute of Integral Studies for, ther to, for therapists to administer LSD and uh, DMT in treating addiction and depression. And one of the things I'm hearing from her is that they know that the, the derivatives are in the pipeline and research on Therapeutic use unknown compounds is approved in the US with human, you know, not for marketing, but for these kinds of clinical um, studies. The thing that they're concerned about that I'm hearing from her is that, as you mentioned, it's there are very subtle variations in the way people react. 
And so the implementation cliff where things go from being tested in the lab with awareness of all these subtle differences, when it goes to marketing or implementation in programs, some of that nuance might be lost, harm might result, and then the program would get a bad name. So are you, are you, how would you address, I know you're still at the early stage and you're not, you're far from test, from testing on human subjects, but is there a thought about, given what you said about the piano chord effect, what do you think about this marketing, you know, when it, when it gets to this stage of marketing, how to prevent some oversimplification and mis misuse does that make any sense <laughs> oh yeah it does and um you know it is something that um i mean i i am learning a bit about how the clinical development works and i think that's why it's a 10 to 15 year process um hmm. to get from the development of the drug all the way to phase three clinical trials psilocybin lsd these things were able to be fast tracked to the stage you're describing because um their their uniqueness in that there was more known about them out the gate you know even mm -hmm. though we still don't know much about them but derivatives um i agree you have to start all over with derivatives uh, as square one with um a lot of toxicology studies a lot of safety studies and this is not something that any company or academic can just make up. Um, I am surprised when, um, because this is a realm that we have to learn about to partner with, um, with the, the entities that will take this forward. There is a very strict policy with the FDA, Health Canada, and the European counterparts, where you have to go through very specific toxicology studies safety studies, which are different from toxicology. It's more about dose. And, um, and efficacy is almost a side note, honestly. It's something that you, 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 you study and understand um, so the drug is useful. But um, the regulatory agencies are very concerned about toxicology and safety um, to the point where that's why it costs upward of $1 billion. And that's not a number I just made up. This is a number that's very standard. It's understood across the community. Um, $1 billion is required at 10 to 15 years to bring a drug from discovery to, to marketing. And I think that's why, because, and even at the end of that, I am not even sure if any drug is perfect, um, but it needs to be thoroughly investigated from a, a safety and toxicology point of view, a lot of animal testing, which is unfortunate because that's where you need to do the toxicology and safety studies. Um, but it's a, mo it's a mammoth effort. Um, it's gonna be a lot harder to get derivatives to market than it was for, than it has been or continues to be for uh, psilocybin or LSD. Thank you, yeah. We don't expect these things on the market anytime soon, if that's what you're asking. Um, yeah, it's going to be a long haul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Uh, we are right at 2 p.m. There's a, a couple more questions in the chat, but I, I do want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Hagel. Um, so if you need to head out, that's perfectly OK. Um, yeah, and just on behalf of the Alberta Mycological Society, thank you so much again uh, for giving us this presentation. It was very, very interesting. Um, yeah. Jacob, don't worry about it. If you're okay with recording and continuing, I can answer more questions. This is the fun part of any presentation, I think, but it's up to you. Awesome. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, in case you had to, to get somewhere, but no, we really appreciate your time. Um, I'm not so. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Uh, so Chips Reed says in the chat, uh, have the results of the treatments with magic mushrooms by the shaman been studied scientifically in the field? Oh, that's a very good question. Oh, I don't know. Um, you know, I know I, I can imagine anyways, right? I swear I've read um, 
ethnomycologists or ethnobotanists that have studied um, not in a, in, a, in a social scientific way, maybe. Um, I'm unaware of um, other kinds of scientific studies where you might measure the pharmacology or, or whatever of these things. Um, that is a question though, because as Martin, I think it was brought up, you have a big difference between what's contained in the natural source, the mushroom, versus what's contained in a pharmaceutical. The mushroom will have a lot of different molecules, a, a big mixture. So what are the effects of the mixture um, versus you know, what you might take as a pill? I think you'll see differences, but um, maybe someone needs to study that, right? If, if you're allowed, I, I, it might be, um, you would have to approach that with respect given the, the nature of the, um, the people going through the ceremony. Um, but I'd be interested. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a very excellent question. Um, cool. Uh, and then the the final question that we have is from Deborah Golding, who asks, "How do you know which substrates are helpful and which are harmful?" Well, you know, I think that was also brought up in a, in a different way by Wendy. Um, you really you don't know until you do the tests. So um, there's a long pipeline in place where you need to go through a certain process um, for derivatives it's going to be a long time 10 to 15 years um, and if you if by substrate you mean like a final product product uh, that would be purifying the final product um, you can't really do this on a mixture um, because then you're not sure what is causing the effect but on a 90 percent pure substance whatever you're looking at you need to first test it on cell lines or membrane preparations um, and actually for toxicology, there's a lot of kits out there, standard studies, um, cell growth, retardation studies. Um, and then once you do a swath of toxicology and safety studies in vitro, you need to move on to animals and uh, do dose dependent studies in animals. And a lot of this is done by what are called CROs. So it's not just you in the lab doing whatever you want to rats. Um, it's actually a very standard procedure done by companies usually that specialize in those kind of studies um, for, for drug companies. And once it passes a large number of tests, both in vitro and in vivo, um, it will move on to human studies in clinic. But by then it's usually established um, what the side effects might be because nothing is free of side effects, but it, it it's relatively safe or they wouldn't allow it to go to that stage. I hope I answered your question. Awesome. Uh, one more from the chat from Devin Garten. Uh, is there a concern with regards to cost of development, marketing, et cetera, when personal production is extremely cheap and easy? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. So. I do get this in a very different context when I'm talking to crowds that are concerned with intellectual property. So yes, it is easy to make some of these things in people's basements. Um, Alexander Shulgin um, showed that was true. Now, does that make it broadly available to most people? No, uh, most people probably aren't like you and, and don't have that um, chemical know-how. Um, and also there's other things like societal considerations. Like uh, if you're you know, in the US um, and you want to be prescribed something to treat your depression, you might be concerned with recuperating some of that cost through insurance. Um, Cause some of these things might cost a little bit, right? So there's all these considerations that really add up to how many people will have access to it. Who can, who can actually make these things? Um, not very many people. So that's why drugs are usually they usually go through this really long pipeline is at the end, you have something that can be prescribed by a doctor, which people seem to trust more anyways. Um, and it can be uh, covered by your health insurance, whether that's public or private. I think that it just reaches a, a bigger audience, a bigger group of people that need treatment. Um, but that's not to say that this doesn't happen where if you have the expertise to make this stuff, Yes, you can make it um, in your basement. Um, I, I'd really recommend maybe 
not doing that <laughs> just because if it's not safe like let's wait for the toxicology studies first um that's my personal opinion because I'm maybe I'm a little nervous to to go that route but you know to each their own um and uh also I, I think it's important to note that big companies big pharma that get involved to make these things get all the way through the 10 to 15 year cycle to, to market um as bad as fake big, big pharma can be they're the only ones with pockets big enough to put out that money to bring it all the way through. And they absolutely insist that the stuff that comes out at the other end is patented. That's because they have no other way of recuperating the costs that they put into it. It has to be protected at the end. There's good and bad with that. Um, I, I tend to think of myself as an academic still in some ways. So I've had to step into the dark side in many ways to understand how this all works. But at the end, I think we reach just more people, more people that might be afraid to take these things without proper testing, people that don't know how really, not everyone's a chemist. That's a very good point. I think very good advice as well. Um, Lucas, you have your hand up, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Hello, thank you all for your presentation. I have a question uh, more from the computer science perspective. Do you think uh, things like uh, deep learning, artificial intelligence can in the future help with simulating this first step of uh, kind of filtering through thousands of proteins to only focus on the most promising ones? Absolutely. In fact, we've engaged a couple of machine learning companies um, to help us narrow the field of molecule types that might be useful. So in particular, we've engaged April 19th, which is the name of the company, and Cognistics. And um, in my interactions with them, I'm becoming a bit more accepting of machine learning. I'm one of these old school people that think it, it, you know, it wouldn't be useful, but I'm, I'm actually shocked. Um, and that's because there's, especially with respect to toxicology and safety, there's large amounts of data um, I'm learning that is um, publicly accessible to train machines, um, including psychedelic type molecules, to train machines or algorithms to predict what molecules might be toxic or, or less safe. Already we're seeing some indications, because um, of course we have to empirically test what comes out of the machine learning to see how accurate the model is. Um, so far, so good. I think it will be a little harder for, um, for efficacy testing because there's less data available to train the machines at this point, but that's the goal is that our pharmacology team will test everything that we generate and, and you know that pharmacology data will be used to train the algorithms. And then the algorithms or the machine will um, basically over time be able to predict for you or at least narrow your search like this molecule type in general is not useful. Forget making those, it, you know, or this one is. And I really uh, am looking forward to that because sometimes you're just in the lab, you're, you're making whatever, you have no idea what, um, what the molecule type it is that should be targeted. You're just adding groups here or, you know, removing groups there, you're a little bit, lost. Um, so I'm looking forward to a bit of guidance from these machine learning companies to, to narrow down the search a little bit for us. Thank you. Wonderful. I believe that was all the questions that we had. Um, so with that, I think we can call this presentation to an end. And once again, Dr. Hagel, we really, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, it was a very, very cool presentation. Um, thank you so much. It's my honor to be here and, and thank you for all the good questions. It's good to see interest um, in mycology in general. So um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. You as well. Bye, everyone.